Thank you very much for joining today for this talk on hidden texts, uh, the biblical history revealed. It's first recording on the 16th of June, but I hope that you enjoy it now and can learn much. Okay, so what are the objectives for today? Well, we're going to look first at the reasons why uh, the texts were actually made secret. Uh, we're also going to look at the selected citations, or a few citations in the Brit Hadasha, which is the New Testament, and look to see whether these um, hidden texts are actually relevant to us today. Okay, so let's uh, crack on. Uh, just looking at a few examples. One is a Baruch, for example. Um, Baruch um, being this scribe for um, Yeremiahu, Jeremiah. Um, he actually not only wrote um, for Yeremiahu, he also wrote his own book, um, or books, um, being a scribe. So you have those. You have um, also Ezra. Obviously Ezra's got a book in the Bible anyhow, but did you know that more books are ascribed to Ezra, uh, t termed uh, Ezra's? Um, you also have Jubilees, another book, uh, Enoch or Canoch in Hebrew, um, and Maccabees, uh, Maccabayim. Um, so there you've got the old, one of the oldest, like Enoch and Jubilees, uh, and one of the later ones of these books. Um, if you want to know about the, what happened between the time of uh, Malachi and Matthew, for example, that 400 years uh, between those books, well, you've got to read Maccabees. Um, anyhow, all of these books, um, they're both the very old and the very much newer, are termed Deuterocanon, or the second books. And the Catholics came with this term, Deuterocanon. Um, so the rules about these second books, yeah? So the, the second book rule, effectively. Um, and so, um, yeah, second books. But you might also be uh, aware of this term called Apocrypha. So if you take the whole Deuterocanon, all, all of these second books that are known to exist or have access to, and you choose some of them and put them all together, you call that the Apocrypha. And so you have a Protestant Apocrypha, for example, containing 15 books you're going to see later. So these are secret or hidden writings. You may remember this uh, slide from the Shema Israel talk, if you've watched it. If not, then please do. It's very interesting. Five parts to it, but uh, a lot to learn there. Uh, the, exant, oh, sorry, the extant Tanakh manuscripts, meaning the existing Old Testament manuscripts, we looked at one of them, which is Septuagint, written between this period 300 to 100 BCE. Uh, one of the most important, as Bible uh, Museum of the Bible say, certainly the most important, uh, one of the most important copies of the Old Testament book. It was translated originally by 70 rabbis, um, and they translated it from Hebrew to Greek, and a total of 46 books. Uh, and hence it has this term called Septuagint, Septa referring to 70. It carries this um, um, uh, th this value here, LXX, referring to 50 Roman numeral. 10 and 10, so that equals 70. In the same way you have the New International Version, you have NIV, or King James Version, you have KJV. Uh, here you have the LXX for Septuagint. The Septuagint that contains uh, all of the apocryphal books, uh, or sorry, a number of the um, uh, apocryphal uh, books, or due to canon books, um, with the exception of a few, such as Jubilees and Enoch, um, those very old ones, um, it didn't contain even, or it didn't contain at that time, when it was first published, uh, or first written, it wasn't published as a book, um, it was a scroll, um, um, but in three and four, three and four Maccabees, because these were written uh, a lot later, um, you know, somewhere between 200 BC and 1 AD, so it, these were added later, and that's kind of reflected when you look at um, Bible study tools, when you look at the Septuagint, you see here, uh, the books that we're referring to, you've got one Maccabees, two Maccabees, almost like it's been added on at the end, you've got three and four. So it's a nice demonstration of the point that they had to have come later. Um, it's important to bear in mind that the Septuagint is an important text and the New Testament writers here, Kepha writing, um, um, you know, is quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 6 to 8. And it says, see Septuagint, if you ever see this in a footnote in your Bibles, um, it's because um, if you look at Isaiah 40, um, um, 6 to 8, it's not going to read like this. If we look at my note that I created, EIS, which is Greek for Isaiah, or Yeshiyahu, 40 um, LXX, so it's coming from the Septuagint. It says here, just like that, all people, all flesh is grass, or all people is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. Um, missing is 7. And then you have eight. The grass withers and flowers fades, but the word of Yahweh, of Yahweh or our Elohim, 
abides forever, but the word of uh, Yahuwah uh, endures forever. If you go to Isaiah 14, the New International Version, verses 6 to 8, you see here in yellow the Septuagint, and you see the additional verse here that's been added at a later date. Bearing in mind, if you read it, you've got changing flow. So when you're reading it, this doesn't flow nicely through. I'm not going to read it now, but you can read it in your own time. Um, it doesn't flow as well. And you've got repeated verse, uh, line, sorry, repeated line, repeated line. If you look at the style of Isaiah, he doesn't repeat lines like that. He doesn't write in a poetic sort of way. Um, so, so much so. Um, if you look at books like Psalms and even Lamentations, Lamentations contains a lot of ar um, acrostic poems. Acrostic meaning... Uh, a poem that goes A, B, C, each line starts with A, next line starts with B, next line starts with C, and so on and so forth through the alphabet. And you have a number of uh, acrostic poems um, within the Bible that um, follow the Hebrew um, he Hebrew alphabet. I can't remember one in Psalms, actually, but I remember reading it, and it actually has all the Hebrew letters um, going from the top to the bottom um, of the page and it's written in the, in the new international version um but anyhow so um <clears throat> so he, he it doesn't tend to write like that you know he's not a poet um he write every every verse tends to be um new information so he doesn't read correctly um great so the septuagint um is cited in all old testament references within the new testament every single one um, but uh, when did all these changes happen? When, the, when was the first time that the Bible, uh, or the books of the Bible, uh, were decided upon? Uh, and that, that first happened uh, at the Council of Nicaea, that famous council, the very first council there, where these, um, uh, you know, new church leaders were saying, okay, we're going to make our new religion, our new Catholic religion, and how are we going to make it? Uh, so within this, they made canons, they made 60 of them at this council. Uh, or rules, uh, and the 60th one approved the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament books. And interestingly, they excluded the book of Revelation at that time, saying it was heretical. And this happened to a number of books, so the, obviously Revelation got put back in, um, and not deemed heretical. Uh, but I've heard um, that Enoch has also been, was also put in, then taken out, then put in, then taken out, and stayed out, um, deeming it heretical. Um, so those changes happened um, over the years. Anyhow, Martin Luther uh, existed around this time, um, and he, he's a father of Protestantism uh, and the Protestant uh, movement. Uh, he translated in 1536 the Hebrew text, the Greek text, to German, um, <coughs> and um, did a number of things, actually limiting the Old Testament. Compared to the Catholic Bible, he took out books, and he put those books in the the Apocrypha, and, and you know, decided on which books he would put in, which ones he would take out. Uh, and he excluded, interestingly, Ivrim, Yaakov, Yehuda, and Utseon, uh, Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. I can perhaps understand why Jude would have been thrown out when you look later. Uh, the, the Jude quotes directly from uh, Deuterocanonical uh, books. So all those hidden books, Jude quotes from. And so even to this day, you can read um, Christians like on their forums um, saying, you know, talking about why Jude uh, quoted from Enoch or the Testament of, of Moshe, for example, um, you know, he, he was misguided or he was, you know, ignorant or something like that. Um, I've read different things at different times. Revelation, why did you throw that out? Well, was it symbols and, you know, the mystery around Revelation? Perhaps that's the reason why. I can't understand why he threw out James or Hebrews, but as I said, you know, men are deciding about this, what they put in, what they don't put in, what they want to believe, what they don't want to believe. Hmm, who told them that, you know? It's just some nonsense. But anyhow, so at some point, some sensible person decided to put them back in uh, the Bible. Um, and anyhow, the, the, the Protestants being very protest um, protesting against the Catholic movement came up with this term called the pseudo-epigraphia. Well, didn't they come up with this term? It is actually a word. It means pseudo, meaning false or untrue. Uh, epigraphia or epigraphia referring to writing. Yes, so... Um, so effectively, uh, a lot of these books, like Enoch, for example, is classified pseudo-epigraphical by Protestants, 
uh, meaning that the said author is not the author, and not only that, but the writing therein is false, is not true, it should not be believed, it's not divine, it is heretical, it is pseudo-epigraphical. And so this, this term exists as applied to those books. So Martin Luther had his doctrines, his rules that he followed, man-made rules. And he followed this principle to his rules, the three soleas they're called, the sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, meaning by scripture alone, by grace alone, by faith alone. I mean, these are common terms that you hear in Protestant churches now, you hear them preach. You know, we, we stand by faith alone, and only by faith and grace save us, hallelujah. Oh no, you say hallelujah. And, uh, through Christ Jesus, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and by scripture alone, even though they don't keep all the scripture, Sundays kept right on Shabbat, the festivals are thrown out. Instead, they change pagan ones into Christian ones and they keep those instead. Uh, nonetheless, they say it's by scripture alone, but it's their chosen scripture. Yeah, it's what you choose to believe. Yeah, what you choose to take on board. Um, and that is not the way the Father asks us to, to do things. Uh, by the way, but this is these three are part of actually a bigger five, um, and you can guess what Solus Christus means. How about Sole Dio Gloria? So Solus Christus, Christ alone. Can you hear that? You've got songs written about um, Christ, in Christ alone and such like that. Um, my cornerstone, what have you? I don't know the the, the name cornerstone is that it's called, uh, or other 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 songs that are called in Christ alone. I'm sure there's they're out there. Um, and you also have Soli Dio Gloria, uh, the gl glory belongs to God alone, yeah, only glory to God, yeah, so, um, so these are the tenets by which he, 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 he wrote his doctrines and he preached and prophesied and said all these kind of things. Um, and when you look forward 500 years after the Reformation, after the Protestant Reformation, and you take yourself to last year, 2017, and this is a copy of or a picture of the Lutheran church. Um, and you can see here, look, the word alone, or the scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. Uh, so at this time, this was the protest against the Catholic church, the splitting and the moving away from Catholicism, from the main religion of the world at that time. Uh, a breaking away, you had the evolution of the Church of England, you had the Baptist church and uh, the Methodist churches and all over, you know, many, many church offshoots, and to the modern age, you had um, other churches, Testament, New Testament Church of God, Pentecostals, uh, Saint the Baptist, Saint the Adventist, you know, all of them offshooting, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and all, all the rest of them. So, all from this, and so all of these churches in 2017, all those denominations would have celebrated this Reformation because they're acknowledging the work of their forefather, uh, uh, Martin Luther, uh, for his great work. In his Protestant reform and uh, the acceptance of all of his teachings, his doctrine, the principles of his teachings. Yeah, great. So, the same year as uh, Martin Luther's death, they had the Council of Trent. In the Council of Trent, they reaffirmed the original Septuagint and New Testament books. And so, the Catholics now have 46 Old Testament books, including, as you would say, deuterocanonical -can books. Um, and also 27 New Testament books, the British Hadesha books, uh, of which we still have 27 in the Protestant Bible. Um, it was the last official canon of the church, no more rules on that. Um, but when we zoom forward to this Protestant Bible, the 1611 King James Bible, so again, it's just a few years after Mr. Old Luther um, passed away. Um, in 1611, the King James Bible was written uh, and they took out the uh, books that the Catholics had put in, so they reduced the number in the Old Testament. They put those books uh, into the Apocrypha and Appendix. There's the Appendix. Yeah, there's your Malachi, and here's your Apocrypha. Good. And then they also have 27 New Testament books. There's going to be somewhere down there, perhaps, or over here. I'm not sure where they put it. It's probably behind the Apocrypha. Okay, so why don't we have the Apocrypha in the King James Bible today? Anyone know? Why is it missing? I mean, oh, that's the original. You know, that is the original. Um, um, 
the simple reason is it's down to a matter of money. Um, and um, when you look into the history, um, it turned out to be an editor's option. So when publishers learned that they could sell as many books um, without the Apocrypha um, as with the Apocrypha, then uh, a change happened. Yeah. So that change resulted in Bibles being published without the Apocrypha books in. Why? Because they could save money on printing and paper, selling as many books for the same price. And so they, become, they became more profitable because of it. To address 14 uh, verse 44 to 45 um, uh, reads, uh, in 40 days, uh, they wrote 204 books. Well, what is the context of this? If we go quickly to um, that, we will see here that we um, have in verse 1, it came to pass upon the third day I sat under an oak, and behold, there came a voice out of a bush against me and said, Ezra, Ezra. And I said, Here I am, Adonai. And I looked up on, and I, looked, and I stood up on my feet. He then said unto me, In the thorn which I did manifestly reveal myself to, unto Moshe. And I taught with him when my people served in Nitzarim, which is Egypt. Yeah? Great. Um, and so, and he told him, it says, many wondrous things. Um, showed him secrets of the times um, and the ends. And commanded him, saying, these are the words you shall declare, and these are the ones you shall hide. Um, and so, as you move down, he says that, um, 23, he answered me saying, go your way, gather the people uh, together and say unto them that they seek you not for 40 days. So he's told to go away for 40 days. He says, verse 36, that, let no man therefore come unto me now, nor seek me for these 40 days. So I took five men as he commanded me and went into a field and remained there. The next day, behold, a voice came unto me saying, Ezra, open your mouth and, you, and I'll give you something to drink. So, Higher up, um, Ezra said, you know, tell me the things, show me the things for the future. And the father said, I'll show you the things for the future, um, things that you should write down. Um, and here it is, it's about to happen. So 39, then I opened my mouth and behold, he reached me a cup full. And it was full as if it were, were water, but the colour was like fire. And I took it and drank. And when I drank of it, my heart uttered understanding and wisdom and grew in my breast. For my ruach strengthened my memory and my mouth was opened and shut no more. It says, El Elyon gave me understanding unto the five men. They wrote wonderful visions of the night that they were told, which they knew not. And they sat for 40 days and they wrote in the day. And at night they ate bread. In 44, it says, and we can go to the actual text in the PowerPoint. In the 40, you know, you have context. In the 40 days, they wrote 244 books So these five men. And it came to pass and under Ezra. And when the 40 days were filled, that El Elyon spoke, saying, the first that you have written, publish openly, that the worthy and the unworthy may read it. Move on, 46, 48. But keep the seventy last, that you may deliver them only to such as be wise among the people. For in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the stream of knowledge. And I did so. So could it be that because these um, men who were attending the councils, uh, you know, the Council of Nicaea, etc., would have had access, obviously, to these books, if they read address and read this and they thought to myself, well, maybe we're the wise ones, you know, we should keep these books back because we're the ones with knowledge. Maybe they they, <laughs> they read this and believed it was them and started doing that. Who knows? But anyhow, there's this command to hide um, the books um, um, and, and, and not let it out until a time of the end, effectively. One of these um, fathers, uh, as they called, um, little F, um, was Origen, and Origen was a theologian of the day. Um, at the same time as Tertullian, if you remember watching Shema Israel, I explained the origin of the Trinity through, um, as applied to the Catholic Church and then into Protestantism, through uh, Tertullian, who was the first man who wrote about uh, the, uh, the Trinity in his book called uh, Adversus Praxius, which means against Praxius. Praxius was another theologian who didn't agree with um, um, Tertullian, uh, had a different concept of who the father was. And so Tertullian, in his book, labelled against Praxius, 
um, labels him a Twitter effective real ignorant man. Um, and how does Origin apply? Well, Origin was another man around his time who supported Tertullian's viewpoint on the Trinity, right? So he wrote a book also supporting the Trinity, but it was published later than Tertullian's book, A Versus Praxius. Um, and um, subsequently, he doesn't get the badge for coming up with it first. But nonetheless, he did other things. But at this point, I'd like just to look at this picture because I downloaded this picture and I put it in the PowerPoint. I was like, well, look at this hand there. Why is this hand inside and why is it been painted this way? Well, with those with insight and knowledge, you'll know that this is indeed uh, the hand of Jehovah. Unfortunately, my power went, PowerPoint went a bit crazy. And you can see here, there's a picture of other people who are demonstrating this. And this is a picture of Seventh-day Adventists, in fact. There is um, Ellen G. White. And what can you see the men doing? Right. And taking a picture. So this is the hidden hand of Jabalan. Okay. Um, and you can read about this in Codex Magica and see many more pictures. Not all pictures like the one I just showed you, but pictures of the modern age. All right. You know, we're taking with, with, with um, in color pictures, you know, of these famous people in this around the world. Uh, who are masons uh, and this name is a name of a masonic god okay and it represents this the hidden hand yeah why because you see something on the outside but i'm hiding something something that you do not know there's something that is behind do you understand that's what this means yeah it means on the outside you see something but there's something behind that you cannot see that is the real power so Jah Berlun, if you break it down, is effectively Yah Ba'al On. Okay, when you when you read Codex Magica, you explain that point. So from that I can therefore tell you that when you know what Yah means, and you know what Ba'al means, and you refer to what On means, which comes from Codex Magica again, I can say that this means worship Lord Osiris. Because if you look in Strong's, uh, Baal, you look at the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew alphabet, you look at the Hebrew la uh, Latins, Yod, and the Hey, and what does it refer to? Effectively, it refers to worship. So, in the Father's name, Yahuwah, is saying to worship me, worship the, even the breath. Yeah, the breath meaning the spirit, the spirit of the Father. Yeah, worship me. And what does his name mean? It means behold, the nail pierced. The, the closed up the nail pierced arm or the nail pierced heart hand behold the person with the nail pierced hand behold who's that that's the messiah so yahuwah means that and so here you take the first part of, of the name referring to worship ja ya yeah and then you put baal which is always which means lord but is tend to be referred to as a pagan lord yeah as in the bible it uses the word lord um use baal sorry and then on, which is Osiris. And Osiris is the, the male or the father figure within the Egyptian uh, trinity, the Egyptian trinity. Um, so, so that's what that means. Um, and so Origen um, publicly um, publicised certain books or said that certain books should be publicised. And he decided which book should be hidden. So this picture is perfect for what we're talking about in the context of hiding books and opening books. So the hidden books are reserved only for esoteric circles. Esoteric meaning intended for or likely to be understood only by a small number of people with specialised numbers, uh, knowledge or interest. So they would have deemed themselves, people like or Origen and Tertullian and all of them, they would have deemed themselves as these people, specialist knowledge or interest, and they would have been an esoteric circle. So many church fathers who would fall below origin, yeah, who weren't the theologians of the day, people who were just the church pastors, priests, bishops, they were not included. Hence, the term apocrypha arose, yeah. The, then they will term these books the Apocrypha, the hidden books that we don't have access to. Um, 
So Daniel 12, 9 to 10 says, he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until when? The time of the end. Yeah, the words are to be rolled up. That's because they were scrolls, remember? Yeah, rolled up and sealed till the time of the end. It says, many will be purified, made spotless. Are we not living in the end? Hmm. You wonder why these books are no longer hidden. Yeah, because they've been sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified and made spotless and refined by the wicked. And the reason why I put guilty is because sometimes we think that we're right to righteous, yeah? Wicked is a, a term which means guilty, yeah? When you look at the Hebrew word, which is raka, I believe, the pronunciation is correct, uh, meaning guilty of sin, yeah? Uh, a criminal, a crime doer, yeah? And so, um, um, we are all crime doers, we're all guilty of sin. The difference is that some of us try our best not to live a life of sin and we try to wash our hands on a daily basis and renew our minds on a daily basis. Our effort is to try and serve the Father and walk in righteousness. That's our effort. We trip up sometimes, but we get up and we keep on trying to go on, yeah? Um, whereas the wicked, the one guilty in sin, the one he's referring to is someone who habitually continues to do the wrong, doesn't renew their mind, doesn't really repent, Repenting means teshuva in Hebrew. Teshuva meaning to turn. Teshuva is 180 degrees. You go in one direction, and you turn the other direction, you go the opposite way. That's teshuva, and that's what it's required to do in repentance. So they might not do a complete teshuva. They might turn a quarter away and carry on in the same rough direction, and then turn back in the same direction they're going. So they might think they're repenting, but they're not. They're walking in their wicked ways. Um, so uh, let's continue. But the wicked, the guilty, will continue to be wicked and guilty of sin. It says, none of the wicked will understand. But those who are wise will understand. So when we're coming to this now, you need to be walking with the Father in righteousness that you might receive new knowledge. Yeah, you might receive understanding. The closer we walk with the Father, the greater knowledge you have. Yeah, the greater insight you have. A divine insight. And this is why when I talk to some people who are not spiritual, yeah, and I talk to them and I say, in the physical, it's this. But you can see it from the spiritual sense. This is what happened. They can't understand what you're talking about. You can quote to them scripture. They don't get it. Yeah, it's like, as, as the apostle Rav Shaul or the apostle Paul says, it's like foolishness to them. Yeah, they don't get it. That's because they're blind. Yeah, they're blind. But we need to have our eyes open. We need to smell the coffee, as, it's, as they say. Uh, see the signs of the times and know that. The time is not now for messing around with sin. Yeah, the time now is to please try and do your very best to walk in a righteous walk. Yeah, put down those sins that cause us to trip and be classified as wicked. Yeah. So to to really mop this up, we need to look at Bible uh, research. Okay, because this is complicated stuff, and this talk could be twenty four hours long. Don't worry, it's not. Maybe an hour. <laughs> Anyway, we go to Newman University, Birmingham, um, and we look at these, um, what they did is research on Paul's writing, uh, Paul's letters, and as it says at the top there, uh, due to a canonical works alluded to in Paul's letters. So when we're thinking about what, what would have Paul read in order to write his books, his letters? Yeah, because we don't just get knowledge, we have to read, we have to go to school, we have to go to university, read the thing, and then we get the knowledge, right? So it's through reading that we understand. So what would he have read to, to, to gain that information? Obviously, he could have got information through through ver word. You know, his teacher was, uh, I think it was Gamiel, um, a, a, a very prominent um, rabbi of his day, uh, very knowledgeable, the, taught by the very best. So he'd have had that teaching, maybe some divine inf inspiration as well, coming directly from the Holy Spirit. I certainly have been told things by the Holy Spirit in my time. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> so of course, but the majority of the information would have come from his reading of the actual Septuagint, the, the Bible, yeah, of his day. And of course, the Septuagint contained all of these books, minus, can you see the mistake? Jubilees. So on the website, when you go to this page, they do rectify this Jubilees a uh, bit, and they say it's an error. Um, so Jubilees is not in there, um, as I said earlier. Uh, equally, 4 and 3 Maccabees would have come a bit later but would have been, Paul would have had access to them because it was fin they're definitely they're finished by 1 AD. Uh, and of course, Paul came many, many more years after that. 
And so what this is, is actually a word cloud. And a word cloud is basically showing you um, um, that the weight of information is demonstrated by the size of the littering. Yeah. So effectively, in the context of Paul, what we're talking about, Paul alludes to the Book of Wisdom and Shirak, for example, and four Maccabees and four Edras, more so than he does in Tobit and Judith, yeah, and Baruch. Yeah, he refers more to these books, and you can see evidence of that. And so if we look at the statement from the website, by far the most illusions are found in Paul's letter to the Romans. We have a total of 76 instances where he there's clear obvious, there's clear evidence that he is um, referring to, indirectly referring to, the Book of Wisdom or the Wisdom of Solomon. Yeah, um, and so the Wisdom of Solomon is, is a particularly prominent, especially within the first few chapters. And it's interesting that the Wisdom of Solomon was dates to around about second century BCE, so it's definitely around for many many years before uh, uh, Paul um, came around or Rav Shaul. So um, Romans 1, 8 to 25 says, the teaching it teaches on the knowledge of Yahuwah, the Father, and the ignorance of, uh, and, and the ignorance and sin of idolatry, yeah, uh, which follows um, wisdom, uh, verse uh, chapter 13, 1 to 10. And you can read this, and we're going to do it now for the sake of time, but you can read it in your own time, and go and look at that wisdom, you can find it on Bible study tools or Bible Gateway, you have to go to like something like the Common English Bible, for example, on Bible Gateway, for example, a book that has, basically go to a Bible that has the Apocrypha in it, and then you can find this um, chapter and read it. Um, but for the sake of the presentation, we're going to go to just to Romans 24, which deals specifically with idolatry that results in sexual immorality, which follows wisdom um, uh, 14 um, uh, verse 12, uh, 24 to 27. So in 124 it says, Therefore Yahuwah gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Yeah? And prior to this, you, you will read in the chapter how he's talking about idolatry. Yeah? And how people have, have given, given over to images that look like reptiles and birds and such like, and they sort of deluded themselves. And that with moral decay, they have now gone into sexual immorality. Do you understand? That's, where it, that's how it flows. Yeah, you can read it yourself. In Wisdom fourteen twelve, it says sexual immor sorry sexual immorality began when idols were invented. They have corrupted human life ever since they were first made. So again, wisdom does the same thing. The sexual morality has arisen from idolatry. The same thing what Paul's saying. They they got their idols, then then they became morally decayed, and then this led into them exchanging natural relations. Women not going with women, men not going with men, but going with the same sex. Yeah, that's what Paul goes on to talk about in Romans chapter 1. So wisdom 14, 24 says, They no longer kept their lives and their marriages pure. A man might kill another by an act of treachery or causing him grief by committing adultery with his wife. 25, 26, everything was a complete riot of bloody murder, robbery, deceit, corruption, faithlessness, disorder, falsehood, harassment of innocent people, ingratitude, moral decay, sexual perversion, broken marriages, adultery, and immorality. Goodness, doesn't that read just like how Paul writes? I mean, you know when he talks about love is patient, love is kind, love is this, love is blah, blah, A list, and he talks about the sinners, you know, the outside, the, not outside, that's in Revelation, but um, like the drunkards and the orgies and the this and the this and this, and you've got a list and list and list of different things, Yeah. Um, it reads very similar, and he read wisdom a lot. Maybe that's why he wrote so many, you know, wrote down so many wise words. Um, but the same sort of style you find in, in wisdom, which came before Paul, um, he, he he takes up this style of writing long lists of um, problems or long lists of uh, acts of righteousness or something like that. Great. So the next uh, verse, we have 27. The worship of idols, whose name should never be spoken, is the beginning and the end, the cause and the result of every evil. Yeah? Great. So what about citations in the Brit Hadasha? So when we look at citations, actual quotes in the Old New Testament, we find one called the Testament of Moshe. Yeah, you never heard of that before. Um, again, a pseudo-epigraphical from a, a Protestant point of view. So... If you're scared to touch it, don't touch it. <laughs> you know, there's no harm in reading a book. You know, provided you're grounded in your knowledge and your belief of the scriptures and your knowledge of the scriptures, then you can read another book <laughs> and find out what it says. 
Um, but of course, Protestants wouldn't touch it with a barge pole, because of course, uh, Martin Luther and their church leaders were saying no. Anyhow, Jude did it. Yeah, he read from it. No, he read from it. He quoted from it. And here's his quote, but even the archangel Michael, Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moshe, Moses, he did not did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, Yahuwah rebuke you. Right? So, here he is quoting it. So, you'll find, if you go into Jude, and why did you quote from Enoch? Or why did you, um, this is the next verse, uh, or why did you quote from Moshe? You'll find some Christian writers, Protestant Christian writers, deriding him. You know, he was mad, he was crazy, he was misguided, his theology was nonsense, he shouldn't be in the Bible. Taking the viewpoint of their daddy, the forefather, called Martin Luther, saying that, oh, I think Jude should come out, yeah? There's still Christians to this day who believe Jude should not be in the Bible. Here we go. The book of Enoch, chapter 2, is quoted in Jude, verses 14 and 15. See, Yahuwah is coming with, with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them uh, of all their ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words godly sinners have spoken against him. So when you think about the Messiah's words, the Messiah also um, alluded to um, due to canonical books. Here we have Matthew thirteen forty three. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Wisdom 3 verse 7 says the just, which is the righteous, the, the righteous shall shine. Oh, just like the Messiah said. Uh, and shall run uh, to and fro like sparks in the wind of being. So bright sparks, you know, free. That's what it represents. You know, when the when the sparks go off the reeds, you see something on fire, and you see sparks flying off. Are they not free? They're like free lights that are being lifted up somewhere. And so in the same way, we shall be lifted up one day. And we are to be bright lights in this dark, dismal world. Um, and so the Messiah uh, uses the very similar words that then the righteous will shine like the sun. Yeah, great. Matthew seven twelve says do uh, refers to not doing to others, sorry, doing to others what you would have them do to you, and this follows Tobit four fifteen and sixteen. Um, but we're not going to that. You can do it yourself. There's Tobit four fifteen sixteen seven twelve. You can look at yourself and, and see how that links together. Um, but here we're going to look at um, Luke um, um, 16, 19 to 31, and also Lazarus. Uh, sorry, we talked about the rich man Lazarus, and we'll see how this follows uh, Enoch um, 22. So, um, shall we perhaps read uh, the Luke one first, um, if I go to that? Luke, and we're going to read it from the New International, since that's the easiest one I can get easily. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so there we are great so uh, 19 it starts there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and living in luxury every day at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table even the dogs came and licked his sores so he wasn't treated well okay he wasn't looked after as the command says, to look after the poor and the needy, even though the rich man was right there. Um, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to a Abraham's side. By the way, this is the Messiah um, talking, you know. So if I uh, take that off, just to prove it to you. Um, oopsie, how do we move my colour? I'm messing it up now. <laughs> so I go off. Yeah, there you go. So it's red. Yeah, just like that. Okay, it's a Messiah talking. So, the time came that the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, or Hades, which is effectively um, uh, uh, hell or the part of the heavens that the, that the sinners or the spirits are held. Um, in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water to cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. 25. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things. 
while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place. Okay, so that you, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. 27, he answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. So send him back to earth, basically, send him to life. For I have five brothers and let him warn them so that they will not come also to this place of torment. Abraham, or, yeah, Abraham replied, they have Moshe and the prophets, yeah, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he says, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to, unto them, if they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets, they sure will not uh, be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Okay, so that's what that says. So now um, we want to go to um, Enoch uh, 22. So if I go to that, um, uh, I could find that for you. Uh, yes, here it is. Just down there, bookmarked. So um, Enoch 22. So this is um, Enoch being taken around by the angel Raphael at this time. Um, showing him heavenly places. Um, it says, verse 1, From there I proceeded to another spot, where I saw on the west gate a lofty mountain and a strong rock, and four delightful places. Internally it was deep and capacious, a really spacious area, and very smooth, as smooth as, it, as if it had been rolled over. It was both deep and dark to behold. Then Raphael, one of the holy angels, who were with me, answered and said, these are the delightful places where the Ruachoth, or the spirits of the souls of the dead, will be collected. For them were they formed, and here will they be collected, all the souls of the sons of men. These places in which they dwell shall they occupy until the day of judgment, and until their appointed period. Their appointed period will be long, even until the great judgment. And I saw a, the Ruachoth, the, the spirits of the sons of men who were dead, and their voices reached heaven while they were accusing. When I required of Raphael, an angel who was with me, he said, Whose Ruach spirit is that, the voice of who reaches heaven and accuses? He said, This is the Ruach of Havel, who is that Abel, slain by who? Cain, his brother. And who will accuse that brother until the sea be destroyed from the face of the earth? until his seed perish from the, from the seed of mankind. At that time, therefore, I inquired respecting of him and respecting of the general judgment, saying, why is one separated from another? So why are the spirits separated? Just as the Messiah said, here, you know, there's a, there's a chasm between us. He answered, three separations have been made between the Ruachoth, the spirits of the dead, and thus the Ruachoth of the righteous have been separated. So the, the wicked and the evil are separated. Just like Lazarus is saying, Please let me over there, Abraham. Let me over there because I'm hot, I'm burning, I'm in torment, yeah? Uh, let me over. And 10, namely by a chasm. What did the Messiah said? Here's a chasm, yeah? Namely by a chasm, by water and light above it. Yeah, so there's a separation, yeah, where they can't go. The same word is used, chasm. And in the same way, likewise, sinners are separated when they die. Isn't that what the Messiah said? So where would the Messiah... And maybe, I'm not saying that Messiah needed to read the scriptures, but of course he did. He read from the scriptures. You know, he's talking about this uh, situation with Lazarus and rich man to this, to tell people what the, how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom and how the, the, the poor will be made, um, those who are, who are poor and lose their lives shall gain it, yeah, the righteous, and demonstrating the separation that happens to them when they die um, is reflected in this book called Enoch. Likewise, let's leaven, and in the same way, likewise, our sin is separated when they die and they're buried in the earth, judgment not overtaken in the lifetime. 12. Here their souls are separated. Moreover, abundant is their suffering until the time of the great judgment and castigation, meaning reprimand, to reprimand someone severely so that the wicked will be castigated. Yeah? Reprimand is severely by our father. And the torment of those who externally escape, escape, meaning people that have a great loathing for our father whose souls are punished and bound there forever. 13. And thus it has been from the beginning of the world. 
yeah, from the first person who was murdered, who died, yeah, Abel. Thus has there been a separation, thus there has existed a separation between the souls of those who utter complaints, those people who say, why have you done this to me? I've been murdered, or why, yeah, you know, the people who have been unjustly died, um, complaints even against the devil, whatever, yeah, complaint, complaint. And of those who watch their destruction, those of sinners, to slaughter them in the day of sinners. 14. A receptacle of this sort, a place of this sort, has been formed for the souls of unrighteous men and of sinners, of those who have completed crime and associated with the impious. Impious meaning showing a lack for respect for the Messiah. Uh, for, for the Messiah, yeah, for Yahuwah, for, for God effectively, for the for Elohim, um, whom they resemble. Their souls shall not be annihilated in their judgment, neither there shall they rise from this place. Then I blessed Elohim, 15, and said, Blessed be my Adonai Yahuwah, the glory and of righteous, or glory and of glory and of righteousness, who reigns over all forever and ever. Great. So, how about messianic prophecies in Enoch? Since we just read from it, uh, for that we have to go to Enoch um, forty-eight. Oops. Yeah. So, um, oopsie. I'm going to read. I think there's an easier way to get there anyway. Uh, maybe not. So Enoch, as I said, it's an old book, so it's going to be found all the way up here. The Jubilees, Jasher, Jasher, as well, amongst them. Uh, Enoch 48, uh, which is there. Great. So let's read from Enoch. Verse 1 says, In that place I beheld a fountain of righteousness, which never failed, encircled by many springs of wisdom. Of these all the thirsty drank and were filled with wisdom having their habitation with the righteous, the elect and the holy. And so my note when I read this was, surely this is the living water. You know the living water we're talking about? Yeah, here it is. Yohanan, John, Yohanan 4, 14 and 15. But whosoever drinks of this water, yeah, that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So, here we have a wonderful example of this, the spring. Look how the, far, the Messiah is saying, a well of water springing up. What does it say that is there in heaven? Yeah, it's saying in verse 1, In that place I beheld a fountain of righteousness which never failed, encircled by what? Many springs of wisdom, of water, wise water living water of these all the thirsty drank are you not thirsty if you're thirsty for righteousness if you're thirsty for salvation if you're thirsty for a life that is not um consumed by sin depression anxiety yeah loneliness then you need to come to the one who gives life through his the water that he can provide yeah the life that he can give you the messiah said my yoke is easy you know, come unto him, draw unto him, he will give you your rest. Verse 2 says, In that hour was this son. Um, <clears throat> in that hour was uh, this son of Adam invoked before Yahuwah Zavot. Yeah? The Lord of hosts, as you would read it in the King James, or Yahuwah of hosts. And his name. In the presence of the Ancient of Days. Where we read about Ancient of Days? Daniel. Let's go there. Daniel 4, 7, verse 9 to 10, KJV. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. So the Messiah is being described now. His garment was white, and the hair of his head was like what? Pure wool. Woolly hair. Describing the Father. Yeah, not straight hair that can fall to your shoulders but woolly hair that sticks up <laughs> his throne was was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire a fiery stream issued and came forth before him thousands thousands ministry ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the judgment was set and their books were opened great 
So here we have reference to the ancient days. We know who we're talking about. So here, is this not messianic? Of course it's messianic. Enoch 48. It's all about the Messiah. Yeah, a book that's written or refers to times or the beginning of time, which is why it's next to like the books like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Great. Because it's tried the, the author of the, the book, uh, of this uh, Bible, the SFR, um, has stated that he tried to keep things in time order as much as possible. Um, so two, in the owl was this son of Adam invoked before Yahuwah Zavot or Yahuwah of hosts and his name in the presence of the ancient days. Verse three, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of heaven were formed, his name was invoked. Listen to that again. Before the stars of heaven were formed, his name was invoked. His name was mentioned. His name was stated. It was affirmed, yeah, in the presence of Yahuwah, in the presence of our Father, yeah, the, the, the name of the Messiah was, that's, yeah, was. So a support shall he be, and he shall be the light of the nations. So this then, therefore, uh, means that the Messiah is named before even time on earth began. And when you look at his name, Yahusha, as rendered in this Bible, the Sefer, Yahush, Yahusha, or Yahushua, um, it means Yah saves. Yah saves. Yahuwah saves. Yah is salvation. That's what his name means every time you call it, which is why it's important to call his name right rather than wrong. Yeah. And this links back to this whole concept of his name being invoked, his name being present. Yeah. If you go to like a um, book like um, John um, 1, let's go to this Bible just to keep the same text. So John 1. Or Yohanan 1. Yeah, look, goes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when you think about the Word, yeah, as I taught my children on Shabbat, yeah, Word, what does Word do? How do you create Word? Yeah, you speak. And what happens when you speak? What do you expel when you speak? And I said, they didn't get it. So I had to say, put your hand before your mouth and speak. And so they put their hand before their mouth, and it says, oh, breath. I said, what's a breath made from? An ear. Exactly. And so I said, the spirit, ruach, means breath, yeah? And it means spirit all at once, yeah? That's what the, the definition of it means. So when the father breathed life into Adam, yeah, he put his spirit in him to understand. And so when we speak the word of the father, it is powerful because we're speaking from the Holy Spirit. It's like the spirit is coming out, do you understand? Yeah, and it's touching the lives of other people, Yeah. That's where there's power in his word, his spoken word. That's where there's power in spoke, speaking the Father's word. There's a book by Joyce Meyer called The Power of Speaking God's Word. Yeah. When you read I E, she's just put a lot of scriptures under different headings, yeah. Um, you know, on arguments or anger or about you know confessions for husbands or wives or that kind of stuff. Yeah. So when you speak those words out and you just speak verse after verse after verse after verse after verse of the father's word. It affects change in your brain. It affects change in the people who are listening. Yeah? And so this goes in line with this, this verse. In the beginning was the word. It aligns with this verse here, which says um, that his name was invoked in the presence of Yahuwah. His, he was present. The name was present. The fact that Yah saves, he is our salvation, that the word existed at the beginning. The spirit existed at the beginning. Yeah? And became flesh. What happened when it became flesh? There was a man flesh that's not God because God can't die, right? Yeah, but his spirit that was in him, that he, that the Messiah was completely 100% obedient to, was God, yeah? Because we have God inside us. What do you say? Our bodies are the temple. That's why we need to keep our bodies healthy and holy and righteous because his spirit dwells in us. Holiness is to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit is given to us. The very same spirit that is, that is called Yahuwah, yeah? Is the same Yahuwah that invoked the name, that came into the man of the name. Do you understand? That was the word, yeah? That was the breath that went into... It's the same. That's why it means it can. It doesn't mean try you and God. It's just that when you say Ruach HaKodesh, you're talking about Yahuwah. When you're talking about the Messiah and the divine nature of the Messiah, you're talking about Yahuwah, which is why it says, I and my father are one. Yeah, when you no one comes to the Father except through me. When you look at me, you see the Father, and that's why the Messiah says, "I pray, Father, for the Talmudim, the disciples, that they might be one as we are one, ekad as we are ekad." 
And I pray for all the other people that they might be one as we are one. We people, we are called to be one with the Messiah, one with the Father. Because when we're aligned with the Spirit, the same Spirit that the Messiah was 100%, because he was an out sin, 100% obedient to, we look like our Father. We behave like our Father. We talk like our Father. Hallelujah. And so can you not see that this is Messianic? Can you not see that the Father has just come to me with his spirit through the words of Enoch? Hallelujah. Because it's talking about the Messiah. Verse 4 says, He shall be the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. Hallelujah. Is that not what he says? All who dwell on earth shall fall down and worship before him. Is that not what you read in your Brit Hadasha today, in your New Testament? Bless and glorify him and sing praises to the name of Yahuwah Zaavot. Why? Because the Messiah is there to point us back to the Father. Yeah? In the beginning, Adam and Eve were with the Father. The Bible says that Yahuwah walked with them in the quiet of the afternoon, right? In the cool of the afternoon, they had they had unadulterous, unadulterated access to the Father. And so the Father, because of the sin, separated us from the Father. He had to create a bridge to back to him. And that bridge is called Yahusha, the Messiah. Yeah? Do you understand? Great. And that's why we are called to sing praises to the name of Yahuwah. Yeah? Name of Yahusha. Which means Yahuwah saves. Do you understand? Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Oh, it's just great. <laughs> so for those of you who might doubt, let's look a little bit more into the history of Enoch and in this case Jubilees. Because um, both of these books were written in Paleo-Hebrew. That's ancient Hebrew. And if you can't remember what ancient Hebrew looks like, it looks like that. Yeah? It was written in ancient Hebrew, and so that's the name of the father, yeah, in ancient Hebrew, Paleo-Hebrew, um, in cave four at Quram, yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah, Dead Sea Scrolls. So Quram is near the Dead Sea on the West Bank, yeah, and there you find caves, and in cave four, that book was found. Good, so the use of Paleo-Hebrew by Israelites, uh, sorry, the use of Paleo Hebrew by Israelites for writing the Hebrew language dates back to the 10th century BCE. Yeah, so all those years back, uh, they can date it back to that time. But the, the Paleo Hebrew alphabet began to fall out of use in the 5th century BCE. So, so many years, so many years before did this Paleo Hebrew die out, yet still the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, in 1948, written in Paleo Hebrew. So, uh, for those people who say that the Book of Enoch was around about the turn of the uh, around about, about AD, yeah, the turn of uh, BCE to CE, for example, you know that time period, um, then that must have been a clever person to be able to write in ancient Hebrew. Maybe they maybe they dated that time through paper. I don't know how, but they were using a, a language that was dead, yeah. A lettering and characters that was dead for, for around 500 years in that case. I find that quite alarming. But anyhow, it was found written in ancient Hebrew, Paleo Hebrew, um, in those caves. So the F. Sefer, second edition, where a lot of, uh, of, the, of the quotes come from in the preface, says the, the credibility of these two books, talking about Enoch and Jubilees, given the find at Quran in the caves. The Dead Sea Scrolls is much greater than the writings of the Brit Hadesh, yeah, the New Testament, where not a single original exists. So here he's saying we've got originals that validate these books, yeah, written in the ancient language, yeah, that is therefore more credible than even all of the hundreds of copies of New Testaments that exist that aren't the original. Yeah, isn't that powerful? That says a lot. So I hope that the doubt might fade away. If it hasn't, then read it yourself. Learn and study yourself. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed the talk. This is uh, the hidden text, Biblical History Revealed.